I'll introduce the panel in just a moment, um, but they will share their thoughts on what the industry is asking for when it comes to contribution and distribution, which is an area uh, both in production and the delivery of content has been subject to a fair amount of change and disruption over the past few years. So the panel will provide some insights into how their products and services have embraced advances in technology uh, and how they're responding to changing demands from broadcasters, production firms, and federations. Uh, thank you very much all for joining me. Um, so just to introduce you to the panel, uh, we have next to me, uh, Michele Gassetti, Head of Sales, Sports, and Events at SES. Uh, we also have uh, Michelle Bass, uh, Chief Product Officer at VizLink, uh, and then Sarah Wu, Director of Product Management, Global Content Delivery Network Services at Lumen Technologies. And just on the end there, we have Mike Burke, who is General Manager of LTN Transmission and Production. Uh, Michaeli, I'll come to you first, if I may. Um, so there's a great deal of focus uh, on remote production over the past few years, of course. Uh, and SES provides uh, on-site and remote production services and uplinks. Can you give us an idea of where demand for these services is coming from um, at the moment and, and, and also to what extent you're asked to provide hybrid uh, services as well? So uh, sort of thinking across satellite, fiber, uh, and IP. Sure, hello everyone. Can you hear me well? Well, what an idiot. It's not a video conference for, <laughs> finally we can meet face to face and that's very nice. Of course, um, yes. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, to, of course, besides the comedy, uh, we, we, we come from years of multiple changes. Our industry has been changing quite a lot. And, and um, what, what, what we understand is that we are now entering in definitely a new era where content uh, is, is the really the central focus of everything. And, and, and for us at, uh, at SES, we, uh, we aim at uh, being a content strategy enabler. We, we aim at supporting uh, our customer in making sure that their content comes across uh, and goes into the right place at the right time in the right format. And, and to that extent, the element of hybrid distribution is, is, is fundamental. Our, um, our objectives uh, stands on, on, on two legs, if I may say, is one is to uh, reinforce uh, the orchestration. We saw how, what are the challenges of orchestrating uh, production. In terms of distribution, contribution is the same thing. We've, we've just recently announced a, a partnership with uh, LiveView, which we are very happy with. That's, that's an important uh, element additional element of our service portfolio. So we need to be able to offer any kind of distribution uh, solution to, uh, to our partners. And, and we cannot just stick on one. Uh, now, now we, we, because of this amount of content, we need to be able to bring everything everywhere. The, the second element of that is, of course, relying on a strong network. And my, my uh, uh, co-panelists uh, here will, will confirm that uh, if, if you don't have a strong network that you can rely on, uh, everything becomes more complex. Uh, so, so, so the element of, as you asked me, uh, hybrid distribution is, is, is really what we are focusing on at the minute. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and we'll move to the end of the line, if we may, Mike. Um, I wondered if you could give us a bit of an uh, insight into um, what LTN provides. And in, in particular, I'm thinking that, you know, as an organization, you work across uh, everything from uh, centralized production, uh, IP transmission, multiplexing, um, you know, for broadcasters, production firms, federations, and so on. Um, and I guess that gives you quite a good view of recent advances in fan engagement, which obviously has been quite close to the top of the agenda over the past few years. Mm -hmm. Um, can you give us a sense of uh, how, how that as a, an area of the industry has been developing Absolutely. over the last couple of years? Yeah, it's interesting at LTN, we, since we do cover everything from, from lens to consumer, that we have a unique insight into the pulse of both the distribution or contribution and distribution industries. Um, it allows us somewhat of a playground to work with our internal resources to be able to develop solutions and, and become more of a connective tissue for the industry. Um, and that connective tissue is it, building a bridge between your traditional live content, the acquisition portion of it to enable remote productions and some others, into more IP-centric, cloud-based productions utilizing our, uh, our data centers. So it, it's, it, it's enabled us to become a provider for providers almost. Uh, so whether it's a private line network or a satellite uh, uh, delivery, we are an enabler to extend beyond the reach of those, uh, of those capabilities. 
Um, so utilizing our proprietary internet-based network, uh, we, we extend the reach and, uh, and provide those, whether it's a virtual audience or it's a versioning of content. Uh, we've seen the versioning of content become very important because for global distribution to digital platforms, that's something from not just the remote production, but unique remote productions utilizing the same, uh, the, the same origination or the same acquisition feed. So that's, that's really where LTN's focus has been. Thanks. Um, Sarah, um, I, I just wanted to ask you uh, about Lumen's role in all that we've been talking about so far. And in particular, um, I guess we've, we, we see a shift of audiences uh, moving to digital platforms, increasingly to watch uh, live events, uh, n maybe not so much um, uh, just relying on for, 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 for on-demand and catch-up programming. What, what kind of problems does that cause broadcasters if you've got a large group arriving all at the same time online expecting a seamless delivery of that content? I think it causes them a lot of anxiety, <laughs> number one. So uh, Lumen, I thought, it, since we haven't been together in a long time, we're level three slash Vivix slash CenturyLink, so we just found out that we work together, <laughs> missed each other by a year or two. Um, no, the more and more the OTT content creators have been snapping up major sports rights um, to the tune of... Amazon Prime bought uh, Thursday Night Football in the U.S. for $1.2 billion. And the pressure on the executives to make sure that they reach all of those people is immense, but it all pushes down <laughs> to the people that have to go and make sure it happens and just make it work. And there's just a tremendous amount of unpredictability in terms of how many people will show up, they'll give us a range of terabits <laughs> of the amount of, of audience, right? And we bear a lot of that risk, right? Because to make it work, it means I need scale. I need to be able to have um, direct contribution from all of these venues. Um, I wanna be able to know down to every eyeball in Las Vegas, how well are you going to be able to connect to them? So very specific information. Um, they want, of course, high performance, great quality of service for their end users, uh, reliability, disaster recovery, <laughs> uh, white glove support, and then somebody's a lot of mention here about just the interoperability and being able to bring so many different tools for workflow in and that's become so unique to every customer. So how do you kind of support all that? So. And you mentioned um, scalability. How, how do you kind of balance that with yeah. profitability, which obviously is a very important consideration yeah. as well? That's where I get nervous, right? No, it all comes from owning our network as being the operator. So from Vivix, our, our contribution, our acquisition and contribution service, we're on net with venues all over the world. So that means we have direct access to Lumen, Fiber, 500,000 route miles, we're deeply peered. So we just don't have a lot of third party costs and that's our advantage that we've had over time. Um, and we own kind of the whole pathway from origin that usually Lumen is also the origin as well. Um, down to, but we also have our mesh delivery platform, which allows kind of peer-to-peer -peer streaming, again, on the content streaming side, which offloads uh, some portion of the content on off of a CDN onto um, a peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's a great capital offset. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle, um, I wanted to get a little bit more specific with you, if I may. Yeah, um, that's fine. And uh, just uh, go back to the Commonwealth Games uh, that took place in Birmingham. Um, there was a trial there uh, between BT Media and Broadcast uh, and the BBC where they trialed a standalone 5G private network, and that was something that you guys were involved in as well. So I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, we provided in this case the transmitters. So the idea is that uh, we are looking at a new generation of uh, wireless video transmitters using private 5G networks. Already for more than a year since MotoGP last year, we're trying to, to develop that, and actually uh, we now also 
bringing it more commercially available. But the problem with existing Coftum wireless video transmitters is that uh, frequencies disappear. There's a lot of st stress from mobile operators wanting our frequency space. So by hijacking it a little bit back, we want to use 5G bandwidth to do wireless video transmission. And uh, together with the BBC and BT, we tried it out at the Commonwealth Games that we really uh, yeah, proved that 5G is ready to be act as a wireless camera transmission uh, technology. And actually in the case of uh, this, this was actually used in a bonded transmitter, so you could actually also bond private and public 5G. So actually if you walk out of the range of your, of your private cell, that you actually can uh, fail over to public 5G uh, networks. And that's of course a very interesting uh, concept because many of our people over here do a lot of productions and sometimes you are at the edge of your network. So normally then it drops out, you get the green flashes and uh, yeah, you know, if you look Formula One, you know what, you, what I mean. But with this technology, of course, you can overcome that. So what, what's next? Commonwealth Games, obviously. Uh, uh, what's next is that uh, for our is next is that we're really going to uh, to offer it as a commercial solution and also in a hybrid, so that you can both boost, uh, use existing Coftum together with with 5G as your connectivity. So no matter where you go, there you can use the same transmitter to use both technologies actually. Okay. Now, obviously, you all have slightly different views of the the, the area that we're looking at um, at the moment. So I, I wondered if you could each just give me a sense of how you feel the way in which uh, live sport productions approach contribution and distribution will change over the next uh, 12 to 24 months and, and, and what those demands from production are likely to, uh, likely to become as well. So, Michele, we'll start with you. Yes, first. thank you. The, well, production will di dictate the pace and, 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 and the changes, but, but those changes will be uh, are the reflection of what, what the audience is, uh, is asking for, right? Uh, without the audience, you, you, go, you go nowhere. I mean, you can produce whatever you want. But, and, and this audience now is asking for more bespoke content, more content that resonates to, to themselves. So the, the transformation we see and that we, we are trying to, to cope with is, is precisely that. I'm repeating a little bit myself, but it's, it's how can you make sure that all this content that is being produced is not wasted and, and, and the content that maybe the director would not be uh, finding relevance to the maximum audience when, when producing uh, the event for the International Signal uh, still get to the niche uh, audience that is interested in, uh, in, in what it is about. So the challenge will be to, uh, to be able to contribute all this massive amount of content supporting the production in that from the venue or from the remote centers where it's being produced and and organizing it and making it available uh, to, 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 the, to the widest audience in a way that it's, it makes sense to them, not in a way that we want it just to be distributed. So, so that, that's a transformation. It's, it's not something that came up these days. It's, it's been a long ongoing process, but it's definitely now getting to a point where it, it, it's really becoming essential that we don't we don't limit the ability to distribute uh, the content. And the technology is there to support that. Um, but yes, we've made investment in various technologies. We have consolidated our, our, um, our technical centers that now we're covering all over the world. Uh, we, we didn't took the COVID as, as a pause, uh, rather than just <laughs> re-equip and get back on track. Uh, so, 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 um, that's 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 the, the the new challenge. The new challenge, I think, for for all of us will be to bring the relevance to uh, the, the relevant content to the audience. Uh, Michel, sa same question to you as well. How how do you think those demands from production are likely to change over the next couple of yeah, years? Yeah, the, the question is there is more content required. So uh, people want, in our case, from the same venue, more wireless camera feeds. If you take, for example, you need a car race again, they won't want two cameras, they want five cameras from the same car and also the whole time live so that their big fans on the internet can watch the driver the whole time. So that is an, a big demand we see coming up. And actually also we see, <coughs> of course, with the coming economic problems, price pressure. So it needs to be for the same amount of money, we need to deliver more. Mm -hmm. And also we see in that sense also more automation coming up. So that's also why we invested quite a lot of time in doing more AI type of production. So that you automate cameramen and that you make it yeah, more, more cost affordable to do these new productions for a lower amount of money. Sarah, how, how do you see uh, this evolving over the next, next couple of years? And, and, and which, which technologies are likely to shape um, the responses to those demands from production? Yeah, I mean, in addition to what they've said, we were never quite sure when we would get pretty hit by the uh, 
any internet or internet transmission, you know, being able to capture a feed via public internet. Um, and I think <laughs> live sports coming roaring back, all of a sudden we have to figure it out, right? So we're really embracing SRT for internet trans, um, transmission. Um, and also I would say being able to give these content creators visibility kind of start to finish. There's a lot of complexity, a lot of different types of content. They maybe don't have a ton of experience with that. They don't like not being able to have control over it. Um, so I think that presents an opportunity for, mm. for people like us. Yeah, and, and same, same to you, Mike. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I think that from a versioning standpoint, maximizing the, the uh, revenue that you can generate from content is key. Um, one of the things that we've found, uh, on, in addition to uh, being able to take in a single feed or, or multiple feeds, create some type of a uh, produce content and it, uh, customize that for distribution to multiple digital platforms, whether it be language, graphics, whatever that may be, the key component of that is the acquisition of it. You have to get the content to be able to do the versioning. So we, we took a different approach at LTN and, and created more of an open agnostic uh, uh, network. So once our, our once proprietary multicast network, we opened that up to accept formats such as SRT, RIST, some of the investments that the uh, production companies and rights holders, rights owners had made during the pandemic in that equipment, we, we, ex we, we welcomed that equipment across our network and we provided that inner layer across internet-based delivery that could have dialed-in latency, so that could be relied on if you're taking a virtual audience, if you're taking a remote announcer, all of this coming across public internet, you can dial in that latency through our data centers and have an expected delay. Um, that expected delay allows you to, pr to, to produce the content more efficiently. Um, it also allows uh, that open architecture, allowed an interoperability with uh, Lumen and, uh, and others that are out there. Uh, so it was more of a seamless integration across the industry. So I think over the next 12 to 24 months, as uh, more innovation continues to, to happen, that we'll see a lot of the once competitive uh, uh, landscape, whether it be from a transport or a production, working closer together. And you mentioned um, versioning being obviously high up for you guys as a, as a priority. What other areas are you, are you going to be focusing on? On the distribution side of it, putting the tools in the hands of the, the customers to be able to do their own playouts to, to a digital platform, whether it be a, a fast channel or, or a proprietary application, uh, putting those tools in place to where they can have somewhat of a, a master control environment, either in their hands or managed by LTN. Um, Sarah, can you give us a, a, a bit of a steer on um, whereabouts Lumen will be focusing its efforts as well? Uh, over the coming months. Um, I liked everything you said. Um, because there's so many different types of um, enrichment that uh, we're doing with, our, our customers are doing with content, a lot of these are some of their own tools that they're bringing to the party too. And they need to be able to run that on some sort of a infrastructure. Um, Sometimes that's public cloud, but sometimes that doesn't give them enough of a control. So I'd say the edge. We're, we're starting to um, see a lot of connections with edge infrastructure, um, more like bare metal or VM, where a lot of these applications can actually be run there, whether in a container or you know, right on the bare metal. And then you know, that part of the workflow, they have fully con control, and then it's also connected for any distribution platform, so I got to sneak an edge cloud in this <laughs> this <laughs> conference. Those words, yeah. yeah. Um, 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 Michelle, you've already spoken about the um, Commonwealth Games project and uh, the, the, the 5G uh, standalone networks that were uh, trialed there. I guess that's going to be a key priority for Vizlink over the next um, next few months and years. Can you give us an idea of any other areas that, as an organization, you're going to be focusing on? Yeah, we'll be focusing, as I said, on the, on the transmission side, that we uh, are able to use private 5G networks. We're also going to offer those uh, as part of our portfolio. So we will be a one-stop shop. Next to that, you can use other networks, like the Nokias of this world. But we also will focus on, uh, on AI, as I said before. So And also enabling, as we said before, to connect to our customers' cloud infrastructure. 
Je talk of course daily with our customers and they all say if you're going to do new investment that will be cloud based. So you should be able to send indeed SRT streams or whatever we require directly into the cloud and enable us to do a real cloud production instead of only remote. And, and Michaeli, the same, same question for you. How, how is SES as an organization and in, in terms of its offering, how is that likely to change? How is that likely to evolve over? I think we'll, we'll, we'll have a greater focus, uh, especially on the distribution side of things. So not, not distribution B2C, but distribution B2B, to uh, bringing the content uh, to the broadcasters and the takers. Uh, that, that's where we, we're really putting uh, our effort at the minute, uh, developing platforms that helps orchestrating uh, that distribution of content. Uh, uh, previously, we were saying that uh, orchestration comes with automation. I, I don't think we want to enter into the field of automation ourselves uh, because uh, ev every event is pretty much different. Uh, you can s certainly achieve that in other areas. When it comes to contribution and distribution, you still have to be able to tweak, adjust, and adapt uh, to, the, to the customers to make sure that they get what they want, the quality what, uh, that they need, uh, maintaining some, some financial uh, balance. So, so we, however, still, we, 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 we can orchestrate better the, the distribution of the content. We can take uh, help bringing the content into one repository, whether it's in the cloud or wherever else, but uh, in one repository and make it accessible to, uh, uh, to, the, um, to the consumers of, the, of that content so that they can, they can pick and choose and select what, uh, what they are interested in. Uh, we, we're not focusing on one specific uh, technology ourselves, as I said, and we are a service provider. So we, we are happy that there's uh, a large... Um, selection of, of partners that we can uh, we can work with to uh, to make sure that this becomes uh, becomes reality mm. and you've, you've spoken about some of the, the trends that you're uh, witnessing and some of the demands that you might have um, from some of your clients as well I wondered if you could uh, now share with us your thoughts on what you think will dominate uh, at IBC obviously show kicks off tomorrow what do you think are going to be the the main uh, technologies, applications of those technology um, that we're all talking about by the final day? Difficult for me to tell you what exactly technology will be, uh, will be uh, coming up most uh, during IBC. Uh, what I can tell you is what, what, what is in my interest, my personal interest, as a, or the interest of SES as an organization, is, uh, is, is to make sure that uh, we, we find a uh, solution that uh, are help us streamlining uh, the way we work. Uh, so so as, as much as we can, uh, benefiting from, uh, from the development in the cloud, uh, help uh, get, getting the necessary support that we need to, to, to be able to uh, ourselves fo focus on, um, on, on our business and, and, and make sure that we bring the technology without having to develop it ourselves. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so, so supporting our, our orchestration. Uh, and Michelle, what do you think is going to be yeah, well, number one talking point? Yeah, number one talking point. Yeah, if I, if I knew that, then I would be really rich, of course, if I could look into the future. But as I said, I think a lot of people will, will talk about indeed cloud production and bringing costs down. So giving it automated. So example, automatic uh, clip production from uh, highlights from, from soccer matches and all those type of stuff. So I expect to see a lot around that. And also that it gets more mature. I think uh, three years ago when we talked about cloud production, it was still a lot of small companies trying to offer it. And you see already a shakeout happening. Only a few bigger biggers are still there. And also they are used now by the bigger players in the market. So that's what I expect to see. Yeah. And, and what impact do you think that's having on the market, that kind of... It, uh, Consolidation, that sort of... Uh, no, yeah, it will be less, uh, less stressful if you see a very small company suddenly popping up with the innovation that, oh, we should have that. So <laughs> that, that it's less, of course, but it, uh, it will bring more stabilization and also common standards so that it's easier to interface and a little bit less cowboy, a little bit more structured production. Because during COVID, we did see a lot of things popping up that were not really compliant with, with standards. So it was a lot of hassle, but of course, we had to go live. And now we can go back to really bring high-quality equipment instead of just... Do it yourself, quick, quickly made solutions. Mm. Sarah, what do you think uh, we'll all be talking about by the end of the show? Standards, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just with the complexity, we have to normalize on something. So whether that's what we're talking about for contribution or for distribution, there's a lot of work going out of, coming out of the SVTA for the Streaming Video Alliance. Um, is, is that something that you, 
you guys are involved in, are you? It is, yeah. In fact, my my uh, colleague has a speech on Saturday with uh, the head of Disney streaming, so check that one out. But it, it's we have to kind of all band together in a way, right, in support of our customers. So making it easy for them to do business with multiple providers, and standards are the way to do it. Um, common APIs, we're kind of there. We're getting pressured a lot to be able to support they want they have one configuration that they want <coughs> excuse me everyone to be able to use so it's a it's a join them kind of situation for us right now and that's great let's do what we do best and help them succeed in this complex environment what what do you think is potentially holding back advances when it comes to standardization I think it's probably just um, the providers that are out there having some inertia about it, right? And it, it, it's easy to just kind of fall back to the way you've always done things, whether that's, you know, for a provider or customer standpoint. And um, that's a, but I think now it's like a different perspective. Live events have come back and it's a new world and there's a lot of excitement about how we do it. And so that's what I, I think that'll kind of fade away a little bit more. So it's exciting. Okay. And, and Mike, you've obviously spoken about the ability, the need to move, move content around, uh, the versioning aspects of things as well. Do you, do you think that's gonna rank fairly highly uh, when we're, we're talking about the things that will dominate I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. It's uh, again, I can't predict the future either. Yeah. But what I what I do believe is that uh, with this panel that's sitting here, if we we're focused on the contribution and distribution portion of this industry, and if we're doing our jobs and we're helping to normalize that those components of this industry, it will unlock the innovation that can happen with more IP centric solutions from uh, remote production from. Uh, uh, the distribution to the digital platforms and some of the others. So I hope to see some of the innovation uh, that's anticipating the standardization of the both contribution and distribution. Mm. And you, you've spoken about um, LTN's position, you know, from, from end to end. Where, where within that workflow would you say are potentially the main, main pay, pain points? And uh, what, what, in an ideal world, would you like to see addressed well LTN's position in Europe so you mentioned at the very beginning we do everything from lens to consumer uh, within within Europe we, we have no interest in doing the production we want to be that normalization factor across our network uh, our open architecture that I mentioned uh, we want to work with production companies with networks with uh, rights owners rights holders uh, to be able to, to, to offer some of the different layers that unlock that potential with the cloud-based IP solutions. Um, like I mentioned before, our worldwide data centers that we have um, allow the interoperability, allow that standardization to be able to cross multiple platforms and act as more of a bridge. And, and that's it, with that bridge, and once we have the normalization, I've mentioned versioning multiple times, mm. once you have that normalization of that acquisition, it unlocks that golden egg of, of being able to distribute content to multiple digital platforms, multiple markets globally, uh, and, and achieve the revenue potential from the content that you're already paying for. Fantastic. Okay, well, listen, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So thank you very much to the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Bekele, to Sarah, to Michelle, and to Mike as well. Thank you. Thank you.